Clint Hodges, alcoholic. Hi, Clint. Glad to be here. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for uh, inviting me. I'd like to thank whoever, whoever, everybody that's responsible for putting this on and who's responsible for including me. I'm uh, very pleased to be a part of your conference here in Modesto. Is that where we... <laughs> How am I doing now? Yeah, the map. The map. Right. San Ramon. I ran into Jim in uh, Southern California this last week, and he said he was uh, had been anointed and uh, commissioned to come over and pick me up at the uh, airport. <laughs> Driving yet another brand new automobile. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> Sometimes you have trouble figuring out who's there to meet you, but Jim and I have been friends for many, many, many years, and he was right up there at the gate, and I thank him for that. I was thinking uh, the other day we were talking about maybe 20 years ago, I was um, calling into my office for messages. And the receptionist, who was kind of new with us, said, uh, well, you certainly live an interesting life. <clears throat> I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I understand you're going to be in Indianapolis this weekend. I said, yeah, I am. How do you know? Well, she said, there's a message here for you, and we're supposed to tell you that the person that's going to pick you up at the airport uh, is going to, it's going to have a wooden leg, <laughs> and he'll be carrying a big book. And I thought, <laughs> okay, you got that. And sure enough, uh, there was a guy at the airport to pick me up. He, he had a big book under his arm, and he had a, a wooden leg. He'd been a hell's angel, got into a bad motorcycle accident, lost that leg. And we're people that ordinarily wouldn't mix. But this guy and I, <laughs> we really did good, I'll tell you. I liked him. He had tattoos, a lot of ink. He had uh, uh, earrings. I told... Uh, Somebody that weekend that that those weren't really earrings that the Ohio State Wildlife Commission caught him sleeping in the park and tagged his ear and <laughs> sent his ass. To AA. <laughs> yeah, but we had fun, and it was raining out there, so I was glad he was in the Pinto and not the uh, motorcycle. <clears throat> he was um, a good guy. He took me to the airport on Sunday morning. He said, I have a gift for you. I said, oh. <laughs> he opened up, a, he gave me a brown paper bag. I opened it up and in it was uh, his first wooden foot. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, Bob. I mean, a lot of thoughts go through your mind, you know, at a time like that. And I'm wondering how I'm going to get security. was a lot easier in those days. But how am I going to... I made him keep it. I told him he might need it. To... And sponsoring somebody else might have a place to stick that foot. I, I had my last drink on August 14th, 1966, uh, and I'm glad that there are new people here. I really am so glad that you are here, and I'm even happier than that for selfish reasons to know that there are people here in this room that have many, many years of sobriety more than me. I am so grateful for that. I am so grateful to learn that... Uh, uh, this program, we don't know how long it will work for a person, but we know that it will work uh, well into 40 years of sobriety. And that's good news. That's good news. We are a... Uh, uh, 
a group that have <clears throat> somehow been invited here. If you're new here, uh, you have responded to an invitation. The universe has issued you an invitation to come here. And it's um, an invitation not issued to that many people. Maybe, what are we, 10% of the population alcoholic? How many get that invitation? I don't know. Not too many. A lot of members of Alcoholics Anonymous around the world tonight, but not, not very many in comparison to all the people that are in deep trouble with alcohol. And you've gotten that invitation. It's a, it's a, in the drink, I think the drinking, the drugging, the running amok, all of the failure, the awful times, I think that that's the anti in to the game. That's the anti up. That's what we do to get in the game. Somewhere in the middle of all that chaos is an invitation. And since you're here tonight, I believe you responded to that invitation. You said yes. You said yes. And I'm glad you did. And it doesn't get any harder than that. We think we have to say no to booze. No, no, that isn't it. It's about saying yes to sobriety. That's it. And that can be, that can be very, um, well, I'll tell you what happened to me when I, when that happened and I didn't know it was happening. I, uh, was walking along the street one day in Glendale in 1966 in July. And a guy pulled over to the curb and kind of popped the horn a little bit. And I looked up and I recognized the face. I walked over to the car because I knew it was a friendly face. And it turned out it was a bail bondsman. Uh, and he and I had done a little business together. And he said, I'm going to take you someplace today. And I was in the kind of shape that I didn't ask where. It really had stopped mattering. I lived in what I called a double garage. And it wasn't that. It, four of us lived there. My wife one day a few years ago said, I want to see the garage. We were over in Glendale. She, and I, I drove down there. I said, that's it. She said, that's it. I said, yes. Yeah. She said, that's not a garage. That's a shed, is what that is. And, um, <laughs> and I looked, and by God, no car had ever gotten into that place. I can tell you that. It was a shed. It was a shed. There was four of us living there. Each of us had a little room, a little 8 by 10 smelly, terrible room with that nicotine based paint that we were all <laughs> a wet mattress on a steel frame. Nothing but in the way of decoration. There was a shower out someplace. I'd lived there for months, and I didn't know where the shower was. I heard it. I could. I had nothing. I had some clothes, a, a box of uh, sheets for whatever. I don't know why I had those. I hadn't had a car in some months. Maybe a year by this time. They they go, as you know. They just they, they just go. I I heard a gal one night say she was saving up for an oil change, but it was like gone. It was just I had a I had a a, a radio in that room, a little a little radio. That was kind of strange, and maybe if you're new, you've had one of these radios. They still have some of them around, at least in Southern California. This radio would uh, just begin to play all of a sudden. <laughs> Not bad music, but um, and you go pull the plug out of the wall, and it keeps on playing. <laughs> you... Um, 
take it out and put it in the dirt, and it, it'll play. That, uh, so I had a radio. I had, oh, and I had an uh, old copy of, in a fit of enthusiasm one day. I'd purchased a Playboy magazine, so I had an old copy of Playboy magazine in there. It was, had become my social life. You know, kind of, honey, I'm home. It's one of those. <laughs> we gave up a lot when we came here, didn't we? <coughs> so I'm walking down the street, and I've been in jail many times. <coughs> I'd slept in the park. I'd been in county hospital. I'd been um, in uh, Lincoln Heights, if you've been down there. Yeah, somebody goes, yeah. Yeah. They closed that. Shut her down. They had a place out in the valley that was, uh, they didn't have any recovery homes or programs like that, but they had a place out run by a guy by the name of Ron Shire. Uh, kind of a spin dry operation. You go in there and three days later they threw you out and you were, they called it Shire's Dryer. <laughs> so I had been around to these places. I was 29 years old. I'm 65 today, and I'm younger than I was at 29. And I'm walking along the sidewalk, and the guy honks the horn, and he says, I'm going to take you someplace. And it's in July, and it's hot. And I didn't ask him where we were going. I just got in his car, and he drove me over across town on Central Avenue. There was what they called in those days the Glendale Alano Club. Whatever that may mean. You know, they had this. And we went up a long flight of stairs and walked into this room, and much smaller, of course, than this room. It was just a little room over a laundry. It had a kitchen attached to it. I walked in there at noon in the middle of July that year. I had been once five years prior to an AA meeting in Portland, and I knew that whatever it was you had going on was not for me and left without going back. Now I'm escorted in. And I stayed with you for three weeks. And then I had some interesting luck. I ran across some cash and some amphetamines on the same day. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, that calls for a drink, right? Yeah. And I'm gone. I'm gone. And on the 14th of August, I walked over to the club, really sick, hadn't eaten anything, tapped out, walked up that long flight of stairs. It was in the middle of the morning on a hot August day in August 1966, and the door was open. There was somebody in that club doing his job in AA because the door was open and the coffee was on. And he smiled when he saw me. And he said, how you doing? No good. No good. He said, what happened? And I said, uh, I got drunk and let everybody down. He could have said a lot of things. Uh, what he did say is this. He said, oh, are you alcoholic? Not a bad question. Not a bad question. And I don't know the answer to that. And so I, I didn't want to get him annoyed with me. I have to be there that day. I don't want to be on the streets. There's too many warrants out. I don't want to be out in that hot sun. I don't have any money. I can't beg or borrow or steal a drink. I got to be there. And it's up to him whether I stay. And he said, are you alcoholic? And I said, yeah, I've been an alcoholic about a month now.
mild case, you know. Uh, I think really what it means is uh, I won't be any trouble. I won't call it, let me stay. I didn't ask him. I didn't beg him. But I'm begging. Let me stay. Let me stay. And the guy brightened. He said, you're alcoholic and you got drunk? I said, yeah. Yeah. He said, we do that. <laughs> Alcoholics do that. And he said, I'll tell you something else. Um, just to clear it up, if uh, you're an alcoholic like I'm an alcoholic, you will drink no matter what. You're going to drink. And I knew that's true. I couldn't have said it, but I knew it was true. He said, good people in AA will tell you don't drink no matter what. You're going to drink no matter what. You're going to drink. And I knew that. I, I'm, I told her, I'll be home right after. I don't get home. I'll bring the check home. I, the check does not arrive. I'll pick up the kids. They don't get picked up. And a marriage goes apart. And another marriage goes apart. And there's three sons. And I haven't seen them in a while. And I haven't seen those women in a while. And I'm living in a shed. And I'm selling encyclopedias door to door. And I'm not very good at it. And I'm saying things to people that I've never met before, like, uh, guilty, Your Honor. I'm sleeping in the park, waking up there. And when he said, you're going to drink no matter what. If you're alcoholic like I'm alcoholic, you will drink no matter what. And I knew it was true, and it didn't give me a lot of hope. I mean, it was clear that he was sober, but it didn't. Sit that. I didn't equate that with anything that was going on with me. I just knew that moment that I will drink no matter what. And I knew it with every cell in my body, because I had quit a lot of times. Didn't you, before you got here, you quit? It's the last half pint I'm going to need. And we go down four more times that morning for another half pint. I'm quitting. I'm quitting. And that's the thing we cannot do. A room full of people with exorbitant amounts of sobriety. And we can't. Those alcoholics amongst us can't quit. That's really important to notice, I think. I mean, in a program where they are always telling you what to do, and where the book lays it out as clean as it can be laid out, you'd think if it was about quitting, they would say so. Yeah. Wouldn't it say, wouldn't it, we had a... Uh, came up here and read chapter 5. I, I would have sworn it would have been step 1, quit! <laughs> Knock it off! God damn it. Tracy read chapter And he said, I'm going to drink no matter what. He said, you'll drink no matter what. And I knew that is true. That's true. There's no quitting for me. And I never drank again. And I'll promise you that I've been crazy enough in 35 years to drink. I've been angry enough. I've been happy enough. I've been successful enough. I have failed enough. I've been humiliated enough. I've humiliated myself enough in 35 years to drink. And I never drank. And I never quit. And that suggests to me as I look back over it that a power intervened in my life that day and removed something that I had been laboring with a long time. 
I had my first drink 13 years prior when I was 16. I'm 29. And I don't know if you call it a surrender, but I gave up all hope of quitting. Because this guy knew what he was talking about. And he said, you're going to drink no matter what. He didn't offer me, like, get something to eat, go to lots of meat. He said, you're going to drink no matter what. It's just that way. And if something hadn't happened to me, it would have continued to be that way. There is, um, we've all seen it on television, the uh, you know, troops that have surrendered, and we talk about surrender as if it's like a little hiccup in the middle of the night. <laughs> troops that have surrendered throw down their weapons and they go sit at the side of the road and they wait for somebody to come along and tell them what to do. And I surrendered that day. And I didn't know I surrendered that day. And you've never asked me to quit. Because you know I cannot quit. Chuck Chamberlain, a guy that was around the country a lot and lived in Southern California, said that about his own drinking, he said, if I'd have known that was going to be my last drink, I would have had two. (laughs) Goddamn right, I would have. There is a point at which we take one step into the unknown only because it's less terrifying than the known is. That's it. And do we have any idea that that's a step into the quiet miracle of a sober life? I don't think so. I don't think so. We just go back to the meeting because here is the place we felt safe for the first time. Maybe ever. Surely in a long time. We go back to the meeting because people remember our names, because they encourage us, because they don't seem to much care where we've been. They're just glad to see us. And it's the only room in the city where that's the case. And we go back and we go back. I was nine months sober and standing at the ocean with my youngest son when I realized that I hadn't had a drink. I didn't know that. He looked up at me, Michael did, and said, Why are you crying, Daddy? It was April of the next year. I'm, And I don't know what I said to him, but I knew I had tears in my eyes and down my face. And I... It's been nine months. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I couldn't have said I didn't quit. I didn't try to explain it at all. Wilson, in this big big book called Alcoholics Now, he says, only this. There at the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time. He was told... By Abby, who made the call on him, that when he was finished with the steps, when he got to step nine, the promise that was made was not about booze. The promise that was made was you will enter upon a new relationship with your Creator. Now, that doesn't really lend itself to a lot of yipping and hollering and cheering. You know, it's like, oh, wow. Fancy that. And we, the, I was looking for that when I was five in the Church of the Air in Billings, Montana. I watched them go down to the front of the church and get saved. I watched them say silly, silly things about that experience. I watched my uncle get sent off to China to be a missionary. I watched the ladies in the church make a lot of bandages for him in China, I don't know. 
That doesn't compel the job. You know what I'm saying? If he needs that many bandages, why doesn't he just come home, for Christ's sake? It didn't seem like a good idea. I stayed away from the front of the church. It didn't comfort me. We were told interesting things, like uh, a, there was a prayer, we used to say. If, and it had a phrase, if I should die before I wake. That'll keep you awake a while. Just <laughs> And the whole, you know, the, the interesting stuff like sex, they just ran from it. You didn't even say anything. You ask one question and the reaction tells you, don't ever ask a question again like that. And, it, and the message distills down in a weird way to sex is filthy and disgusting and ugly, and you should save it for the one you really love. <laughs> you go. I don't think so. And so that religion thing, I didn't get it, I didn't like it, I was baptized when I was 13 years old in the Yellowstone River one spring. That water was about 31 degrees. We believe in complete immersion, you know. God, that was cold. But I'm a seeker. A guy named Scott Peck who's written some interesting books, none about uh, AA really, but some... The Road Less Traveled, he touches on uh, us. And he says, for us, for alcoholics, wine is cheap grace. I get that. I get that. I don't know about your first drink, but mine, I remember. I remember. I was 16, two years prior, I'd stood at my mother's grave. Oh, how I hated her. And they were burying her. And as angry as I was, right underneath that in a layer I could not reach, I adored her. But what my thoughts were that day as they threw shovels full of dirt on that coffin, I stood there and said, you don't love me, I don't love you, I don't love you. I stopped breathing deeply that day. And two years went by and I met a foot party after a football game and somebody's got vodka and we pass it around. And I took a deep breath for the first time in two years and developed a relationship with alcohol. I had faith in alcohol. Faith in drugs. I believed in alcohol. I believed in... And I mean drugs. I took amphetamines so I could stay up and study all night. But it is interesting, isn't it? When you buy a bottle of booze and you put it in the glove compartment because you can't drink it then and you feel better. <laughs> that's faith. You go into the university pharmacy and you get a little prescription, a little piece of paper for those amphetamines so you can stay up all night. And you put it in your pocket. Whew, that's better. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Can I hold the door? And so we have capacity for faith. We have capacity for belief. And we've been making do. And I read that book, and I noticed Wilson, and God, this is just awful. He says stuff like this. You're not going to believe this. It's in the book. He says, God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. And I'm at, oh, how nice for you, Bill. You know. <laughs> and yet, if you stick around, one day you notice that's, that's, that's my story. One day we begin to find ourselves in that book. I mean, his impact on me was sudden. On the 14th of August, I was a drunk 
On the 15th, I did not drink and I did not quit. And I know who did that. I know who removed that obsession. His impact on me was sudden. That is moving right along in the blink of an eye in a day. Things have changed enormously. And it's true for every alcoholic in the room. I don't know your date of sobriety. But I know that's a fundamental and profound change in a day. In a moment. Profound because it went right to that little piece of me that needs a drink all the time. And that obsession was lifted out of me. Never to come back. And so, after a while, you get a little curious about that power. I've, before you do that, if you're like me, uh, and a miracle like that has happened to you, uh, you take credit for it. That's how I avoid knowing about the miracles in my life. I take credit for them. And I develop a little uh, formula. Well, how are you staying sober? Well, I call my sponsor every day and I go to seven meetings. And I, no kidding. Wow. I thought you were beyond human aid. Well, if we get a lot of people together uh, somehow. And one day it just gets so cumbersome you have to say, you know what? I'm sober by God's grace. I didn't even quit. And I've had a lot of formulas in 35 years about how it all seems to me. But it's getting simpler all the time. It's getting simpler all the time. But then I keep a big book in the middle of my life and I keep my butt in the middle of a chair in an AA meeting. And that really keeps the perspective going on. If you're, I'll tell you a little something about these people if you're new. You've stumbled into an AA meeting. You've stumbled into a little conference here. Uh, you will hear about sponsors. You'll be told to get a sponsor. You'll be told to connect yourself with a human being that is sober longer than you who can guide you through this maze on the theory that you are in strange territory when you're living a sober life. And we are. The only problem, and maybe you've already noticed it if you're new, these sponsors have a tendency to want to get right in the middle of your personal life. <laughs> and you got to watch them like a hawk. <laughs> but you don't want them to wander off, so every once in a while you'll throw them a bone, right? What happened? Did that? Did it all fall apart? Is it going now? That sounds better. All right. You can. Who's got a chair up? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you telling me that. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Where do you want me to? Should I just go way back? I really did forget where I was. <laughs> These sponsors will drive you crazy. Because you got to throw them a bone once in a while. And you got to make it a question that either way they answer it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Shall I wear the red socks or the green socks? Wear the green socks. Oh, thank you. You saved my life. <laughs> I've been thinking about this because of this last few days over the 4th of July. I spent the day, my wife and I spent the day with uh, my son and his wife and three kids down in Newport Beach. And there was no way he and I were ever going to have any kind of a relationship. And one day, because his mother is uh, somebody that I hated so badly, and one day I went up to my sponsor and I said, I got a problem. And he said, yeah. Thrilled to hear from me. I said, I hate my ex-wife. Oh. But he wasn't real flip. He just said, 
Do you want to do something about that? Oh, man. No. I really enjoyed hating her, you know what I mean? It's something to do on the freeway and all that. But I didn't say that. I said, sure, I want to do something about it. <laughs> Wouldn't have bothered you otherwise. <laughs> he said, well, if you want to change how you feel about somebody, change how you treat them. Okay, thanks. <laughs> we were over there in that backyard. He said, uh, how's that child support coming along? I mean, he's really threading the needle now, right? He says, oh. I said, I'm going to get to that. He said, yeah, yeah, you really are. You really are. You've got a court order. You've got a job. You can afford it. And you want to be cute about it. And I want you to start paying that child support. And he told me how to do it. I didn't have a checking account until I was five years sober. But I got another money order every payday at the bank, and I had an envelope with me, and it was stamped, and it had her address on it. He said, you will not take that money order back to your apartment and put it on the dresser and think about it. And I wonder how he knew about that. And I started doing that. He said, if you don't do that, if you don't want to do that, get another sponsor. He just dismissed me. So it seemed to mean a lot to him. And um, I help where I can. Well, by the end of that year, and I did that, I never stopped doing that. I never stopped doing that. And by the end of that year, when it, when it was time to go pick him up at his mom's place for Christmas event of some kind, I really uh, felt more like a man than I had ever felt in my life. And this last, on uh, the 4th of July, Linda and I were down there with his family and a bunch of friends of his at his home. Beautiful home in Newport Beach. And we laughed and we wept and we carried on and we hooted and we hollered. And we had a wonderful time. And he proudly introduced me to his friends. And he loves my wife. And his kids are gorgeous. He's got a boy going to Harvard next fall, this fall. I mean, these kids have had their sleeves rolled up. And I could have missed all that. And so I know if you're new, you have a silly sponsor. But just do what they tell you to do. Because none of it will make sense to you. How could it, you know? They're in reality. <laughs> And I'll tell you something else. Dream your dreams. Dream your dreams. Commit yourself to this program. And dream your dreams. If you have a dream about being in a really good relationship, if you're a little weary as I was of arrangements and don't quite know the difference between an arrangement and a relationship, I guess I won't explain that. <laughs> you can have it. Don't be realistic. Don't be realistic. If you want an education, get it. A guy came up to me when I was five years sober. He said, uh, you ought to go to law school. I said, come on. I wasn't selling encyclopedias anymore. I was selling carpets. Nothing wrong with selling carpets, but I didn't have my heart in it. He wouldn't let me off the hook. I finally looked into it. I got to work during the day. I got to, if I go to school, it's got to be at night. And I got to go to meetings. And it's like four years. I said, do you know how old I'll be in four years if I go to law school? And you know what he said. He said, how old will you be in four years if you don't go to law school? <laughs> I went. I helped him with that. 
And so I'm nine years sober, and the state of California gives me a license to practice law. Is that something? I mean, it's like, what the hell is that? They wouldn't give me a license to drive a car when I got here. <laughs> and I've been doing that all these years, and I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. It's been a fun thing to do between meetings. You know what I mean? It's great. A lot of fun, a lot of anxiety, a lot of throwing up, but a lot of really good stuff. And a lot of opportunities to learn what my character defects are. We, uh, we, pract we practice our character defects and call it advocacy and send out a bill. It's a good system. We really love it. And you slowly clean it up and slowly, slowly, slowly do it clean and discover it does better clean. You can love them all during an entire trial. I represented one of the cities in Orange County and we had a long involved trial and they were wanting to get their money back and at the end of the day I was able to call into the last day after the jury had come in. I called the deputy mayor of this city and I said... Uh, we're done. He said, how'd you do? I said, I got every dime back that you wanted back. He said, how did you do that? And I didn't want to tell him I just loved everybody for two weeks. I didn't think that would sell very well. <laughs> I said, it's what you hired me to do. I mean, the, the, the deal works there because you've taught me to be in the room, wherever I am, in the room, in the room. I mean, I might have five boxes of documents and I might have every temptation to go start pawing through those documents and grab the right one. But then I lose the room and I need to know where the judge is and where the jury is and what the guy's saying in response to my question and what the other attorney is doing. And you've taught me just to stay in the room and tell the truth because I know what's in the box. If I'm willing to just let it go. And so it's been a lot of fun doing that. It's been a lot of fun doing that. And I would not have had it but for you. And the day came, as it does I think for a lot of us. I happened to be 23 years sober when the bottom fell out for me. Everything that I had worked so hard for was coming into my life and had been in my life for a while. And my, de my dependence on God transferred to my dependence on my image and the money and the house and the, all that and the yeah, arrangement. <laughs> and I heard something that was... Uh, I mean, I just... And I stayed in AA, and I was doing the deal here, but it shifted for me. And nothing was fun in here anymore. There wasn't any joy in it. And I didn't have any relationship with God. And I knew that. All I had was kind of a low-grade anger and frightened all the time. And going to meetings was okay, but... It didn't seem to be taking me where I wanted to go. And so, I went back to the steps. I went back to the steps. A kind man took me through the steps. And I was really hurting. I tell you, I was, uh, uh, and it was very real. My partner came to me and said he didn't want to play anymore. And he was the rainmaker and I was the trial goat. Suddenly I don't have, and the money stops, and the burn rate goes, that's gone. I owe a lot of money, and the house is sold, and she left. I moved down to a little apartment that I hated. I felt like such a failure, and I was more frightened than I had ever been. I have a, a brother, there are four kids in our family. The brother that's my age is alcoholic and 20 years sober. I have a little sister that's not an alcoholic, lives happily in Denver. And I had a little brother that was not an alcoholic and very angry. And he spent a little time in the Air Force and then he got out and then he started uh, working at a McDonald's for a while and then he just started pushing a grocery cart around Atlanta. And he died doing that 
about five years ago. And I would go back to Atlanta and find him, run him down, grab him, come on back, Bobby. No, he wouldn't do it. He has to shake his fist. His message was, you see what they did to me? And we all have that message a little bit. If my folks had raised me right, would I have to be living in a shed? Would I have to be push a cart? We have a point to prove. And he, his point to prove killed him. And I had a point to prove that I was going to rise above it all, above my history. And I uh, got very afraid because I knew that I could be pushing a cart. And I was really in despair. And I, uh, because of God's grace, a guy came into my life that took me through these steps. Again. Again. At depth. And I came into a relationship with God. At step two. Is God everything or nothing? Oh, I don't know. That's a stupid question. <laughs> well, how have you been living your life? Have you been living your life like it's everything? Like he's everything? No. But he's not nothing. But I don't think he's all he's cracked up to be. Well. <laughs> and they asked me to look at it from a slightly different point of view. They said, what are the five things that you will not give up for a better relationship with God? Oh, I got five things. I don't want to give up greed. I don't want to give up control. I don't want to give up sex. I don't want to give up anger. I don't want to give up my career. I don't want to give up... I think there were seven. <laughs> and they, so the guy was great. He said, these are seven things that are more important to you than a better relationship with God. And we're at step two. I said, yeah. He said, that'll be pretty colorful because you're going to be asked in a little while to make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of number eight on a list of eight. How do you think that'll go? I don't think so. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> no, no, no. And so that got changed around because I asked that it be changed around because I'm desperate. And that I'm so full of fear and the, and the inventory was just for me. Who do I resent? I resent people I'm afraid of. Who do I fear? People I'm afraid of. What about that sex inventory? Isn't that my attempt to get rid of my fear? Isn't that an attempt to get something out of a relationship that isn't in it? Just so I'll feel powerful? I'm looking for power. I've been looking for power since I was a kid. And I don't have it. I don't have it. And I had to look at all of that stuff and I had to get on and read it and I had to get on the road and do uh, a lot of soul searching at six and seven. Make amends. I knelt at graves. I did what it says to do and went to Portland to visit my brother to Denver to see my sister to the women that I had been with whose dignity I had taken because I have to say here's the wrong I think I did. And tell them. And tell them I'm there to set it right. And what would you have me do? What can I do to set this right? I took your dignity. I lied to you. I broke our vows. What can I do to set it right? And they'll tell you. <laughs> they do tell you. And they should. And if we are really willing to do whatever it is, it opens them up so they can say it. And we have to shut up and listen to things that we don't want to hear. And at the end of that, we walk away free. Or we walk away doing whatever we said we would do to set it right. I raised a boy for five years because somebody in an amend said to me, take care of my boy. Okay. And I started taking guys through the steps and watched them go out and do these amends. And it's astonishing. It's just astonishing. See, they get, there's power. We tap into power. Can't do an amends from step one. You've got to get the power from one to do two and the power there to do three and four and five. And you get the power for the amends from step eight and the willingness from step eight. 
And by this time, we're in a relationship with God. And this guy is a felon. He's a burglar. He's a window washer. A nice set of careers, I think, don't you? Uh, He always knew where to go back at night. And he had 13 or 14 places in South Pasadena that he had burgled homes. And he had a record. And he said, what am I going to do? I said, you know the answer to that, don't you? He said, yeah, I'm going to go to those homes. They told me, if you're going to make financial amends, take money with you. (laughs) (laughs) They told me about direct amends, about sitting with people. Can I make the amends by phone? Did you do the harm by phone? (laughs) No, I showed up for that. This guy gets through 12 of these homes. He goes and knocks on the door. Hi, did you live here five years ago? Yeah. When your home was burglarized? Yeah. I did that. You did that. Yeah. What do you want? I came to make amends. I came to set it right. Who sent you? I want to be free. And i got to make it right. Now, he could have been arrested and gone back to jail at any one of those. And there was one he couldn't get to. He went by once. Nobody's home. He went back again. And he couldn't get out of that truck and go up to the door to save his life. And he called me on the third day. He said, I'm going over there today. It's the last amends. And incidentally, I've discovered there's a big difference between making all the amends and making all of them but four. That's a big deal. It's big. And they can be completed. And so he says, I'm going over there. It's my last amends. And he sounded scared. I said, you want me to go with you? He said, no, I'll go. I'll call you when I get done. And he called me at 11 that morning. He said, I'm done. I heard it in his voice. I said, Tom, how'd it go? He said, they were very uh, interesting. The lady came out on the porch and talked to me for a while, and then she invited me in, and she had a lot of questions. Like, how come you broke that mirror there? Well, I thought there was a safe behind it. Did you do this? Did you do that? He said, I told her what I recalled. And I told her I was really sorry, and then her husband was there. And they're talking. Then the cookies come out. And then he said, uh, i got to ask you a question. What can I do to make this right? And they said, you've, you've done it. You've done that. He said, I don't think so. He said, yeah, you've done it. Because you see, until right now, this morning when you came by, we always thought that our son had done that. And a family healed up and Tom got free and I saw a miracle. And got a great, a great appreciation for God's grace in our lives. This is recovery. And when you look that word up in the dictionary, recovery has an interesting, interesting definition for us. It means the extraction of something precious out of that which appears to have no value. And that's happened to me, and it will happen to you if you're new, and it has happened to all of these people. You stay close. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.